everyone for coming along to this afternoon session of PyCon 2013. Uh, up first, we have Titus Brown, who is going to be talking about awesome big data algorithms. Please make him welcome. All right. Hello, everybody. Hello, everybody. OK. So um, I'm Titus. I'm talking about awesome big data algorithms. And um, well, I was looking through XKCD, uh, and I found this awesome algorithm here, which resembles fairly closely some things that get handed into me for homework. Um, <laughs> although I must confess that this one on the right, panic sort, is much more closely related to real computer science homeworks. Um, I do like the touch return kernel page fault at the bottom here. So, um, so I should warn you, if you're, an algorithm, if you're an algorithms person in computer science, you're going to be deeply unhappy with this talk. And I'm okay with that. Uh, I'm really a computational scientist, much more so than a computer scientist, although I am in the computer science department. And so I'm going to be trying to give you guys the intuition behind a couple of really nifty algorithms that um, I've been starting to use lately. And so I'm going to be using IPython notebooks to, to sort of demo and explore algorithm behavior. And I'm uh, really interested in your questions or comments. My Twitter handle is there, or you can email me. Um, I'm one of the few Tituses involved in Python, so it's easy to find. So some features. Um, uh, two years ago, I gave a similar talk on just bloom filters with respect to my research, and people said, I saw on the Twitter stream people saying, or Convor at the time, why is he using Python and not C++? Right? It's like, well, I'm, I use C++ in, in the real world, but when I'm trying to explain things to people, C++ is usually the wrong language to use. So everything here is going to be in Python, but of course it's trivially portable to C++. Um, I'm using IPython Notebook to demo, and I'm not covering your favorite data structure or algorithm. Um, so I'm going to give you three basic examples. This is the basic idea of what's going on with these data structures and algorithms. Three examples, skip lists, which are not particularly efficient storage-wise, but are very interesting from the sort of random uh, data stream perspective. Hyper-log-log -log counting, in which we count discrete elements, and then bloom filters and uh, count min sketches, which I've been using in my research quite a bit. And uh, at the end, I'll talk a little bit about my research, which is folding, spindling, and mutilating DNA sequence. And then I'll give you some uh, um, references for further reading. So the basic thing that's, that's happening more and more is we, we, we're getting a lot of data sent to us in some way, either coming in from databases or logging or the internet, or somehow we're just getting this massive stream of data shoved at us. And um, I don't like the term big data, uh, so I like to go with data of unusual size. And um, it's, this is really the kind of data, the, the real point here is it's data that you can't brute force. Maybe it's because you're using an Arduino, maybe it's because you're using a supercomputer and the supercomputer is still running out of memory, but whatever it is, you can't just do the thing that we all want to do, which is load it into a dictionary, because it's just too big, right? If you can load it into a dictionary, do that. It's way better. But if you can't, then you might want to look at some other data structures. And so some of the examples that we'll be looking at are, suppose someone hand, hands you a sort of very large or basically infinite data set, and you just want to count the approximate number of discrete elements in that data set. Or if you want to um, use an approximate pre-filter to say, look, my queries are really expensive. I want it, my database queries are really expensive. I want a lightweight test to see if, the, if, if I can tell whether or not the element's likely to be in the database or not before I execute that expensive query. Or, um, and I'm actually not going to talk about this in this talk, but suppose you have a bunch of, of distinct elements in, a, in a, a very large data set and you just want to get their frequency distribution. How many are high abundance, how many are low abundance, that kind of thing. So, um, the first thing to realize is that large is really hard, but infinite is much easier. And this is a truism that was given to me by one of my colleagues, Rich Enbody, and uh, I haven't been able to find a citation for it. But basically, as soon as you think about having infinite data, you start to realize there's no way I can do multiple passes over that data, right? It's just too big, infinite, right? There's no way I can do an offline algorithm, an algorithm that loads in all the data once and then goes over it again to do something else. And this is very typical of sort of bioinformatics algorithms where we have very large data sets and we run some program on them and they load the entire data set in and then they go over the data set again to extract some information. And if the data set's infinite, that first pass takes a long time. The second pass takes even longer. Um, <laughs> So offline algorithms analyze a data set all at once, but then online algorithms are explicitly built to analyze data as it comes in, serially, one piece at a time. And then there's usually the sort of further distinction of streaming algorithms where you have limited memory or limited compute. You sort of you think of it as real time. The data's coming, 
I've got to handle it. Uh-oh, more data's coming. I've got to have handled the data I was already handed. Um, it doesn't necessarily need to be real time, but it can be, uh, it gives you a different, uh, a slimmer approximation of an online algorithm. And then there's this other distinction that's really interesting, um, which is an exact data structure versus random algorithm or probabilistic data structure. And so often it turns out if you just want to know how many data points are in a given data set, often an approximate answer is sufficient. I'll give you a really stupid example of this in a, in a slide or two. But if you can place bounds on how wrong the approximation is likely to be, that may be good enough, right? Do I need to allocate X amounts of memory or Y amount of memory? Well, how much data do I have? Can I count it quickly and efficiently before committing to loading it all? And then what you'll see today is that often random algorithms or probabilistic data structures can be found that have good typical behavior. Because in general, most data is not going to give you worst case behavior on these data sets, data structures, but they may have extremely bad worst case behavior. So computer scientists have only started to embrace them as the data sets have gotten extremely large. Um, right, so here's a stupid example. So, so suppose you, you have a bunch of uh, integers and here um, I selected uh, 5,000 that are in the range 0 to um, 2 billion. Um, and you just generate a list of those. And you say, well, I want to, if I want to generate the average of this, um, I don't need the lowest 8 bits of those numbers to generate a pretty accurate average. Right? So this is a really stupid example. I'm just trying to give you guys a little bit of the intuition. So if you, if you just take all of the numbers in that original list x, and you trim off the lowest 8 bits, and then you go on and you take the averages of x and y, and then remultiply the y um, every element of the Y list, or the, the average by uh, 256, you'll see that the actual fractional difference, the percent that's wrong, is very, very small. So you've gotten rid of a good quarter of the data in doing this sort of removal of the eight lowest bits, and you're getting an answer that's essentially exactly almost exactly correct. This is a very simple, stupid, straightforward example of the idea that often there's a lot of data that doesn't really matter for the computation you're trying to perform on it. So what you're trying to do is figure out which parts don't matter, which parts do matter, and keep the parts that do matter. Um, so the first thing I want to introduce is something called skip lists. And these are basically, uh, you can think of them as linked lists that are, are faster or are an alternative to balanced trees. And the underlying idea is that you have a linked list, it's, think of it as a set. You have a linked list of objects uh, here, 1 through 10, say. And the linked list contains all those objects in the standard linked list way. But as you know, what, if you want to insert, delete, or find things in a linked list, it's, it's usually order of the length of the linked list to find those things. So what you do is build several levels of indexing on top of the linked list that randomly, in this case, index into various aspects of the linked list. So if I want to find six, I can go up to level two. Actually, I can go up to level three, and I can say, well, level three, the first one's one. That's, that's less than six, so I'll keep on going. Four, that's less than six. Oh, this is six, so I've got it. If I want to find seven, I, I go along the highest level until I find six. I can't go any further because this is the end. I pop down a level. That's the next one still isn't seven. I pop down a level, the next one's seven. So, um, and the nice thing is, in general, if you decide which, which uh, nodes you're going to insert into each level randomly, you get typical behavior of O log N. And the code to implement this as opposed to implementing a balanced tree is, this is like 10, 15 lines of Python code as opposed to implementing a full balanced tree um, algorithm. So to give you an example of this, let's see if I can, if I can tempt the demo gods and uh, show you some code. So the first thing we do is we define a random function. This random function basically says, given a max level, give me a bias distribution of, uh, of levels so that most of the uh, levels we pick at random are gonna be one or two, and then there's gonna be an ever diminishing number of levels that are chosen three or four. And this is the, the number of times, the, the number of um, nodes we're gonna index at random. And then you implement you uh, implement things with a bunch, of, uh, a bunch of Python code. This is uglier than I'd like it to be because I put in some print statements, and I'm going to ignore it. I'll post these notebooks later. Um, but what I want to show is what happens. So, so we create this data structure skip list. We say, let's have a max level of four. And that's how many possible indexes into any given node there will be. We um, insert numbers b between 0 and 20, every, every even number between 0 and 19. We insert that into the list. And then we can print out the data structure. And so what you can see with this data structure, I don't know if you can see it in the back, but what you can see with the data structure is that um, at the base level, level 0, you have all of the elements, all of the nodes in the list, 0, 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, whatever. At level 1, you have a subset of the toes. You have 0, 2, 4, 6, 8, 12, 14, um, 14, 16. 
And then at level two, you have two, four, and, and 16. So every time you do this, because it's using a random um, algorithm to choose how the, those nodes, those level, the nodes in level one and level two are chosen, every time you rerun this code, you're going to get a different output for those levels. And if you want to see how insertion works, when you insert, if you turn on verbosity, if you insert, you see that, um, let's see if we can walk through this. You say, I want to insert 11 into this linked list. OK, well, if I go up to level 2, 11 is greater than 10, so I need to drop down a level. So at level 2, value 10, I need to drop down from level 2 to level 1. I go down to level, uh, well, that doesn't seem right. I, mean, I hope I didn't break this code while I was preparing this. Anyway, the idea is it would, then at level one, it would go all the way over to this node 10 and, and insert before, uh, and then drop down to 10 here and insert 11 before 12. And uh, if that actually works, we'll see. So it, it worked, it just didn't print things out properly. So you can see um, now that we've inserted, it's, it's inserted the 11 before the 12 and it did so in a very small number of traversals. Uh, not one traversal as it says here. <laughs> And so if you, um, if, you, if you run some code to, uh, let's see. So suppose you want to, you want to profile this. Um, and I'm just going to run, because I, I don't like thinking hard, I like to just run, let the computer do the Monte Carlo for me. I'm going to run a Monte Carlo where essentially I try a bunch of, uh, I specify a max level and a maximum count, and how many times I'm going to run this. And I'm going to count how many traversals it takes to, uh, to, to retrieve the last element of the skip list. And if you run all of this, hopefully this will work. If you run all of this, what you can see is that as the level, the max level of the skip list increases from one to say nine, the time it takes to retrieve the 200th element from the list goes, the number of traversals it takes to retrieve the 200th element of the list goes from 200 down to about 50, down to about 30, down to about 20. And so the more memory you allocate for the skip list, the more index, in, index insertion nodes you, you provide, the quicker it is to retrieve, to insert and retrieve any element you want from the skip list. And so the underlying logic here is just, is actually very simple. It's that, um, it's that asymptotically, this, this has really good behavior. You can always luck out with a really bad set of random levels being chosen, but in general, 99.999 repeating percent of the time, you're going to get extremely good behavior out of this, and it comes from about 10 lines of Python code implementation. Um, and uh, I, I found a really good quote on Reddit about skip lists. If someone held a gun to my head and asked me to implement an efficient set or map storage, I would implement a skip list. And the response, which most of you can't read at the bottom, is, does this happen to you a lot? <laughs> Um, which, anyway, so, so I think the lesson that I, 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 I take away from skip lists is, is you want to channel your randomness. If you can construct or an otherwise rely on randomness in your data set or in your algorithm, then you can easily get good typical behavior, even if your worst case behavior when you analyze the algorithm is really, really bad. Um, and at this point, it's worth noting that a good hash function is essentially the same as a good random number generator. A good random number generator takes a seed and generates some number that is basically completely unrelated to the seed. And you can generate, it's an expensive hash function, admittedly, but you can generate randomness with a good hash function. Good hash functions are essentially random and unpredictable, right? Why does this matter? Well, suppose you want to count the number of the cardinality, the number of individual objects, unique object types in an incoming stream of many objects. You have many billions of objects. You want to track how many distinct objects there are. You want to accumulate the count of distinct objects over time. Suppose that um, one example that I saw online um, for this outside of the biology domain was uh, uh, I wanted to be able to detect um, denial of service attacks. Um, and denial of service attacks would be characterized by many, 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 many individual IP addresses coming and, tackling, uh, and attacking me, or alternatively, a very small set of IP addresses with a, with a massive amount of traffic, one or the other. And you would be able to say, well, we're getting a lot of individual IP level traffic, or we're getting a very small amount of individual um, source host traffic, uh, and both of those are suspicious, suspicious circumstances. And you don't want to allocate a lot of memory to count these things. So um, at this point, I'm going to give you a rel uh, what I view as a relevant digression. So, Suppose that you, you flip some unknown number of coins, and you want to track, it's, 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 it's a, seems seemingly irrelevant, how often do you flip coins without keeping track of how many coins you flipped, right? But let's just, just bear with me. So what's something simple that you can track that will tell you roughly how many coins you've flipped? Well, it turns out that if you track the longest run of heads that you've seen so far, 
that's a proxy that tells you pretty accurately how many coins you flipped overall. Right? If I flip 100 million um, coins, then I'm going to get this wrong, but I think a log base 2 of a million, it, it, or e to the uh, 2 to the power of the longest run of heads you've seen, is essentially will tell you how many coins you flipped. Um, and so basically, uh, if you just do the math, and um, I have a little, some little simulations, right? Doing coin flips in Python is really easy. So uh, let me just bring this up. So you, you, have a, you have something that generates coin flips. You have a longest run of zeros, which does a really stupid algorithm that's easy to understand for counting the number of zeros you see. And then you run a bunch of simulations. As I said, I really dislike thinking hard. And um, then you plot the distribution. What you can see is, suppose that you run, uh, do 100 runs of 1,000 coin flips, and then plot the distribution of the longest run in, that, in those 1,000, um, uh, uh, in each of those 100 coin flips, uh, in each of those 100 co uh, runs of 1,000 coin flips. If you just plot the histogram, you can see what we would expect to see is a peak right around log base 2 of 100, because we've done um, uh, log base 2 of, uh, uh, I think I inverted it's 1,000 runs of 100 coin flips. You can see that we get a peak of the distribution right around 6. So here we're just keeping track of the longest run of zeros in that. And from the distribution of, of the longest runs of zeros across 100 runs, we can track roughly how many coin flips must have occurred. And you can see that this scales as you, as you do more coin flips. You can see that the distribution shifts, and it basically remains log base 2 of the number of coin flips you're doing. Um, so here that's 8.9, you can see the distribution is basically centered around 9. So if you, if, you can, if you do that, it turns out that you can use this as a way to do counting of distinct objects. So essentially what you do is you, can, you take a bunch of objects, you convert all of those objects into hash values, and then you look at those hash values and you count for each hash value the longest run of zero bits that you see in that, in that hash value. And that tells you how rare that hash value was, which gives you an estimate of how many objects you've seen, how many distinct objects you've seen. And as long as your hash function's not probabilistic, as long as it's reliable, you'll find that you converge closer and closer to the correct answer. Um, and there's a couple tricks to this, implementing this in reality. One is that you want to use multiple hash functions, so you can take the average. And the other is that you want to use something called the harmonic mean, and the other is some low and high sampling adjustments that you can read the paper for um, why exactly how that works. But it turns out that the code for doing this is surprisingly simple. Um, I'm going to, uh, I, I stole this from GitHub, which I guess isn't really stealing, right? It's borrowing. Um, and essentially, you define how many, uh, uh, um, you want to use multiple estimators, so you define how many estimators you want to use. In this case, it's two to the number of, the, of eight, two to the power of eight. And then uh, you basically, uh, de develop a function that tells you how many bits are zero to the left of a given number. And you can see that if you just run that function row, uh, you can use, um, if you just run that function row, you can see that, for example, there are, if you take two to the 152, uh, okay, well, off by one, but there are 153 zero bits to the right of two to the 152 in this case. Okay, so what you do is you, yes, you initialize your estimators. Uh, let me make sure I hit shift enter on everything here. You initialize your estimators. So we have 256 estimators. And then to add a given uh, a number, what you do is you take the number, you convert it to a string, so you can feed it into a hash function, in this case, SHA1. You take the hex digest, you convert that into a number. And then you, um, you have multiple estimators, uh, which, and you, you figure out which bin you're going to place this in by just looking at the first seven bits in this case. And then you take the remaining bits here. So this is the bin you're putting the, the, the number in. You take the remaining bits, you count how many zeros there are, and you increment the appropriate bin by the, uh, by the count. So this is giving you, you have to, you have to keep track of 256 um, different estimators, each of which in this case is a long, but you could make them shorter. Uh, and then you can do things like shove a bunch of data into it. So in this case, we're going to do uh, 100, we're going to insert 100,000 numbers between 1 and 1 billion into that. And then if you estimate the cardinality, the estimated cardinality of that is, is 98,837, which is pretty close to 100,000 here. And the estimate cardinality function is mostly pretty simple. It's this, which is the harmonic mean, um, plus uh, some constants, and then a bunch of corrections for if you have small number of um, number, small 
dis number of distinct objects or a large number of distinct objects. But so it all comes back to this central idea that what you do is you, uh, what you do is you just track, it, it, it's literally as if you're flipping coins and you're just treating each hash value as a random source of flipped coins and using that to estimate how likely it is that, you know, how many, how many um, values you've looked at so far. If you keep on adding things into this, which you can, you can keep on doing, um, and you estimate the cardinality again, you can see that I've added another 100,000 and the estimated cardinality is 187,000. Note that this may actually be more accurate because we're choosing random numbers that may have some overlap here. But so, so the fundamentally the hyperlog log counting system is basically as simple as, um, as, as watching a, a, a string of coin flips um, and just using the hash function to generate that random set of coin flips from your incoming object. Okay, so, so the other data structure that I wanted to show you is Bloom filters. And this is a set membership data structure that's probabilistic, but really only yields false positives. And I'll show you exactly why in a sec. It's really trivial to implement. It's basically a hash table or a set of hash tables. The hash function is the main cost and it's extremely memory efficient. And um, I'll see if I can walk through this a little more slowly than the kind of thing. So the first thing is I'm gonna use IPython blocks, which is, um, a software written by Matt Davis to help uh, do cool displays in IPython notebook. So um, I just want to give you that little color demo. You basically can, can write little for loops and stuff to go over the IPython blocks. And I think his talk is tomorrow at like two-ish. So check it out, Matt Davis, IPython blocks. So to implement a Bloom filter, what we're going to do is write a hash table function. And now this is stupid, right? In Python it comes with a hash table, it's called a dictionary. In this case, though, we're going to implement a very silly hash table, one that doesn't track collisions. So we have a hash table of a given size, and we have an array of zeros, right? This is obviously something that you would implement as a bit string in C, but bear with me. To add a number into this hash table, what you do is you just take the modulus of that number by the size of the hash table, and you set the bit to one for the associated uh, value. Okay, no collision tracking. We're just saying, hey, we're going to set these bits to one. And then to get, what, to get the number, to, tech, to test to see if num is in that uh, Bloom filter already, you just do the reverse. You, you take the modulus of the number and you check to see if the bit for that is set. So this is why you don't get any false positives. It, this is why you don't get any false negatives. Once you've added something in, it's always going to be there. And the only chance that you're going to get a, a wrong result from this is if there's an, a, a number that exactly collides with this set of hash, hash values. So, so that's neat already. But if you combine them, it turns out, you can do way better. So what you do is you essentially take multiple hash functions, or in this case, multiple hash tables. You take a set of sizes in, you initialize a set of hash tables of those sizes, and then to add uh, a value, you add it to each of the hash tables. To retrieve it, you test to see if a particular value is in each one of the hashes. If, if it is not in one of the hash tables, it's, it was never added to the set. If it's in all of the hash tables, you say it was added to the set. And you can do all sorts of things to calculate, it's fairly easy to calculate the false positive rates of, of set membership in this. But I wanted to, sh to, to show you how it actually works. So suppose that I create a Bloom filter with um, three hash table sizes, size five, size seven, and size 11. And it's gonna start out as three hash tables, one of size five, one of size seven, one of size 11. And then I add the number 253. Now, when 253 is added, what's going to happen is it's going to modulus 253 by 5 and set that corresponding element in the, in the hash table to 1 or red. It's going to modulus um, 253 by uh, 7. It's going to set the corresponding bit to red. It's going to modulus 253 by 11 and set the corresponding bit to red. And then when you uh, ask, is 253 in there, it's going to go in. It's going to say, well, this bit set, this bit set, and this bit set. So yes, it's in there. Now the trick is, next, next you add, um, what number did I add? Uh, 8132, and it's setting an additional set of bits in here. In this case, the bits are not overlapping. Is that me? Okay, anyway, in this, okay, that's not me, unless something bad is happening. Okay, so um, it's an out of power for a notebook. I bet. Okay, so, so what ha what's happening with the Bloom filter is you're slowly filling up the Bloom filter. Um, and this is a really small Bloom filter, right? We have uh, five, seven, and 11 size hash tables. And so if you want to watch what's actually happening, as you add random numbers in, the table becomes more and more full. 
Your predicted false positive rate for querying things and getting the wrong answer, that is, is this thing in there? Yes, it is, even though we never added it, goes up simply because the, um, simply because the tables all get more and more full. This turns out, though, and I'll show you a graph in a little bit, to be more memory efficient than any possible hash table implementation. So it's a great way to use it. It's a great way to develop a pre-filter where you uh, want to use a small amount of memory to decide if you want to do a more expensive lookup, maybe to disk, for example. And the way you calculate the false positive rate, the, the, um, the estimated false positive rate, is you just look at the load of each hash table and then uh, take the product of the load. Um, and as I said, I'll post all of these. So, so the way you would use this uh, is, is to just, let's see, the way you would use this is you, is you would just, you'd create it, you'd uh, start adding numbers into it, and then you'd start querying numbers with x.git, uh, which is here. And um, I will say that Bloom filters have been used in, for network routing tables and databases for a while, but people had been sort of stumped as to what else they could do. So um, that's what I'll talk about next. Okay, so, uh, right. So what am I using all this stuff for? Well, um, Usually when I put this slide up at biology conferences, there's a groan because for the last five years it's been a part of every bioinformatician's talk, but I figure you guys are fresh meat, so um, I can show you and still have it be all new and cool. So Moore's Law, the thing that has brought us iPhones and Androids and Arduinos and Raspberry Pis and whatever, um, uh, shows the uh, logarithmic, uh, well, the exponential decrease in cost that um, with time of you know, hardware, basically compute capacity. And this line here is the uh, super, well, it's, it's still logarithmic, but the, um, the extra super logarithmic or exponential decrease in the cost of DNA sequencing. So DNA sequencing, the ability to generate DNA sequence has been dropping significantly faster than our ability to compute upon it. Um, and what this tells you, I usually put in some snide comments here about big data. What this tells you is that if you have um, linear or super linear algorithms for dealing with data, you're kind of in trouble, right? Because you're, you're generating more and more data for any given amount of money, and to buy the compute capacity necessary to deal with the data, you're, uh, you're spending ec ever more money, exponentially more money, actually, on the compute. And uh, this, I like to title this slide, you know, why Amazon won't solve your bioinformatics problem, although they'd like to tell you they, they will, because the gap between here and here is, their pro is, is how much more money you need to give them every year, right? So, um, so, so we need better algorithms. So I think what, what, what this slide really tells you is that we need better algorithms. And so um, what I work on is shotgun sequencing. And shotgun sequencing is essentially the process of uh, feeding DNA into a paper shredder and digitizing the, the shreds of DNA that come out and, and then trying to reconstruct the book from that digital data. So, uh, and, well, I mixed metaphors there, but you sort of hopefully get the idea, right? You take a library, you feed it into a paper shredder, and now you want to algorithmically put things back together. Um, the NSA is interested in this. <laughs> um, uh, not the DNA part, necessarily. Um, so, so there's a couple cool things about shotgun sequencing. So one is that it's randomly ordered. Another is that it's randomly sampled, which are sort of the same, same things. Um, or similar things. And the, and the third is that it's getting too big to efficiently do multiple passes. So um, by too big, what I mean is any computer that you bought three years ago can no longer do it. You have to buy a new one. And even then, in a year, it, you won't be able to handle it. So um, we need better algorithms, basically. So uh, the, the main concept I want to introduce is, um, to tell you what we've been doing in my lab is the concept of coverage, which basically says you have some unknown genome that you're feeding into the paper shredder, and you're getting out little shreds of DNA with some errors in them and Xs that, that, that you can relate back to the original genome, which in this case is still unknown. There's a the concept of coverage, which is on average how many times is a particular position in the original genome covered by a shred of paper, and how many shreds of paper is it covered? And you can do that by just drawing a line down from the genomic sequence. And so if you look at, at it just puts on random sampling statistics, which is sort of works by, you can see that if you look at a position in a synthetic genome and you, you just sample it to an average depth of 10, you're gonna have some sampling that's at a depth of two or three and some sampling that's at a depth of, of 15 or 20. And that's just random variation, right? You have a string, you're reaching in, you're picking positions from the string and you're accumulating um, um, sampling at each location in the string. And of course you get a Gaussian basically out of this. Um, in terms of coverage. So on average, your bases will be covered in the genome will be covered to a depth of 10, but there will be some that are covered zero times, there will be some that are covered 20 times. 
And this is why, so, so when I say covered 10 times, if you sequence a 300 gigabase, a, a three gigabase human genome, which is uh, essentially the amount of DNA in one sperm, so it's haploid human genome, you need to, to get enough coverage to see every base more than three or four times, you typically need about 10x to 10 to 15x coverage of that human genome. So you need um, 30 to 60 gigabases per human genome. And as the genome gets bigger, that alt number gets bigger, so you actually typically need to really look at what's in a human genome, you typically need uh, between 150 and 300 gigabases per, per genome. And we can now generate this amount of data for about $5,000 in about a week. So, um, the data is massively redundant, however. If you look at this red line, this red line is 5x coverage, 5x coverage. You only need the data that's at this line and, and well, below it. The data above this line is stuff you've already seen five times or more. So, what we developed in my lab is um, a streaming algorithm to get rid of this redundant data. And it's, we call it digital normalization for arcane biological reasons. And essentially what you do is as you get reads that come in, you build an online graph of where those reads fall on your unknown genome. And then at some point you start to realize that the number of reads that cover a particular location on the, uh, on the graph is d deep enough that you can now reconstruct this portion of the original genome um, uh, without any further sampling, and you can start to reject reads. In other words, your new, day, as the, your new shred of paper is... Um, uh, redundant and no longer needs to be collected, and so you can discard it, and in doing so, you also discard the uh, errors in that read, and essentially what you end up with is choosing a vast subset, a, 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 a very small subset of the data, discarding a vast majority of the data for many applications um, as being redundant, and um, essentially making everything downstream of this analysis quite a bit faster. Um, and we combined this, so this is a streaming lossy compression algorithm where we essentially discard redundant data and, and do essentially error correction along the way. And we combine that with storing these graphs, which I haven't really introduced yet, I introduced them two years ago, but um, no matter. Basically storing this path along the DNA, the, the genome, in a bloom filter in a very efficient way. Um, basically we can store these graphs uh, better than the best possible information theoretic storage. So um, because we have a really sparse hash table space, a really sparse occupancy of the hash tables, um, we can store, uh, um, this is the exact storage uh, for a given number of words, a given number of elements uh, for different element sizes, and ours are significantly better than all of them except for this far right, far right regime. And if you want a visualization of what we're doing, and I don't remember if I showed this before, but essentially what we can do is we can take this graph, we can store the nodes in the graph in this bloom filter, and that lets us um, uh, compress the graph down. And the interesting feature of this is that as we increase the compression, um, the graph uh, grows false positive nodes but none of the original nodes are lost. So this is a, a lossy compression mechanism that only introduces false connections in the graph. And so uh, the publication that this um, connects to actually used percolation theory from physics to show that how far you could compress the graph down before you started connecting across, uh, across um, f making false long-range connections across this graph. Okay, so, so uh, I like to point out this problem used to be completely intractable, this question of how to take all this data, stuff it into a graph and do graph analysis was completely intractable for some of the, the problems we were facing. We implemented all of our stuff in C++ and Python. We've changed the scaling behavior from data to information by discarding redundant data. We're not losing information, but we are throwing away data and errors. And for some of the biological samples we were looking at, we managed to scale the, the required memory from about 10 terabytes of memory down to less than one terabyte of, me of memory for two terabytes of data and it's currently taking us about two weeks to analyze, to process that data, which is about on the order of how long it takes to generate that amount of data, which I think is a good, if you can analyze the data as fast as it's coming in, that's, that's, that's a minimum requirement, right? Um, smaller problems are pretty much solved. We can throw away, for your typical human genome resequencing, we can throw away 95% of the data and still get the same result out. And we're just starting to explore optimization approaches. Um, we're doing this all with one thread in, on a one terabyte of memory machine, which seems like a little bit of a waste. Um, and so all of our algorithms and stuff, the, all, everything I've shown you is, is basically multi-threadable, multi-coreable, and uh, we have a, a grant proposal in that I, I'll give you a link to, um, to make it all work that way. And our real goal in the end is to scale to about 50 terabases of data. So right now, um, with our current 
approaches that are 10x better than what other people have, we would need 5 to 50 terabytes of memory. And it turns out that the NSA doesn't let us use their computers. So we don't have that much memory. OK. So um, I guess I'll, I'll, I'll sort of conclude a little bit which, by just saying, I, I think uh, I'm, new to, I'm relatively new to probabilistic data structures. Uh, I only started working on them about four years ago. Um, and the, the sort of living with uncertainty, embracing streaming concepts, channeling randomness, the idea that, you're, you, that randomness in your data set can lead to good asymptotic behavior, good typical behavior, even if you still have weird random worst case, weird worst case behavior, is, is pretty cool. Um, and also, I think for all of you that are doing big data and data-driven science, uh, don't be afraid to discard your data. Um, and, and I feel like at this point I should say, uh, I'm an open source hacker, works on Python. Um, I am a professor. I can confer PhDs. Uh, all you have to do is come to Michigan, work for long years for low pay, um, and uh, you know, think about it. Just don't talk to Brett, Brett Cannon, about PhDs first, because he had a bad experience. And he'll um, he'll tell you too much about what you would expect, what you would actually expect, in my lab. Um, okay, so I'll just leave it there, and I'll leave you with some references. So I swiped a bunch of code from uh, John Shipman. Skip lists are well described in, Wiki in Wikipedia. I'll put this up on SlideShare and tweet it in a sec. It's also available on the PyCon slide thing. Hyperlog log um, is, is the, 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 by far the best explanation I've seen it is on Aggregate Knowledge's blog, and there's a very tiny link here that you can go to. Uh, and then there's also a nice GitHub implementation in Python. And then for Bloom filters, the Wikipedia explanation is, is as good or better than any. And then I have some links to our work in my lab. In particular, under interests, there's some, um, some fairly descriptive ways, uh, grant proposals for how we're proposing to apply this to big DNA sequencing data sets, which is increasingly, uh, well, it's basically what I work on. Um, and I would be happy to correspond with people about, um, about that. So thank you, and I'll take any questions. If you have any questions for Titus, could you please approach the microphone in this aisle or come up to me? And I have a D6 here. I'm going to roll it. If I get a one, I'm not going to answer your question. <laughs> Sorry. Hey, so if you're throwing away uh, redundant reads after a certain point, how do uh -huh. you deal with repeat regions? <laughs> you must be a biologist. In fact, I know you are. Um, so so the, answer is uh, the answer is most of the downstream approaches don't work with them anyway. So what we do is we uh, do the first round of analysis and then re-include the data that we've thrown out to, to bring some of that redundant data back in. Uh, but let's just say that that's a work in progress. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, we have a question in the other aisle. Hey. Um, that graph of the cost of megabase sequencing versus Moore's law. Yeah. If the cost of capturing data is falling much, much faster than the cost of processing it, could we conceivably reach peak data? <laughs> <laughs> oh, look. My dice, my die rolled a one. Um, um, peak data, I'm not sure. Well, OK, so, so, so I'm going to answer your question I'm going to take your question and run with it in a different direction. So I'm a professor. I get to I get to do that. So, um, so so one of the things we, end, we so how many humans are there on the planet? Right, six billion. Right? <laughs> Five billion plus or minus. And. Um, and, and so we could sequence all their genomes, right? There's only 5 billion genomes. That's 5 billion times 3 gigabases, well, 6 gigabases, because most are diploid. Uh, so that's, um, someone do the math for me. And then multiply that by 100, and that's how much data we would need to get everybody's, everybody's genome sequence. Um, but the problem is, your body doesn't actually have just one genome sequence. Not only are there somatic mutations that happen in, in various cells, but can't, uh, tumors, for example, undergo high mutation rates. Your immune system undergoes mutations. So, so I think we're going to reach the point where it costs 100 bucks to go into the doctor's office and get your, your germline cells, your somatic cells, and your immune system cells all sequenced. And then you'll get a report saying you should probably stop smoking, which you already knew. <laughs> um, so I don't, I, I don't know if that's what you wanted me to address, but um, uh, that's what I felt comfortable addressing. So no more questions? In that case, I, could I, I think Zach may have another. Oh, do you? Well, I was thinking, and then you sequence your microbiome in your gut, and then that. Well, that's a whole different. Yeah. Yeah. I don't want to confuse matters. 
Okay, in that case, everybody please thank Titus for his talk.